Okay, so let me share. Everybody, oh, that's the wrong one. Can everybody see the dimensionality reduction screen? Yeah, perfect. Great. Okay. So what we're going to be talking about is dimensionality reduction. Um, but then also a main like a big part of the chapter is about recipes and using these. So I think they kind of they've used this chapter to talk about dimensionality reduction, but also as a kind of vehicle to introduce recipes, which we haven't, I think, looked at on their own before. So that's one of the objectives to understand recipes, uh, creating, prepping and baking them outside of using workflows and also understanding four different dimensionality reduction techniques, PCA, PLS, ICA and UMAP. And then at the end, we talk about using these techniques in conjunction with modeling and comparing the results. So a kind of quick overview of recipes. So we've sort of um, used recipes before as part of workflows, but uh, today we'll be looking at how you use them outside work workflows. So recipes are basically a series of pre-processing steps for data that normally happen as part of a workflow. But you can do this outside workflows to uh, individually to prep the data and to bake the data, which allows you to kind of explore the data and see what happens and basically kind of test and debug, I think. So what they show here in this diagram is the kind of analogy to using a workflow. So the prep set, uh, step calculates the statistics from the training set. And this is kind of analogous to fit within workflows, which estimates the um, recipe and the model. And then predicting in workflows would be analogous to bake where it take, takes the what we've done and applies it to the data. So this chapter is going to use I mentioned now to reduction to give an example of how to use these. By the way, please feel free to jump in if there's any questions or anything or comments. So to go back to dimensionality reduction in general, why do we do it? So one reason is that it makes it often easier to do visualization of our data, exploratory data analysis in general. If you've got a lot of different variables and lots of different observations, you might, you know, there's a lot that you could look at, there's a lot that you could potentially plot. But doing dimensionality, dimensionality reduction allows us to uh, plot more easily the structure of the data and look at relationships and clusters between observations. Another important reason is to avoid having too many different predictors in our data set uh, and therefore improve model performance. So one example given is that of linear regression, which is that, for example, the number of predictors should be less than the number of data points in your data set. If you have a huge number of predictors, you might not have this and then you have big problems with overfitting. And then there are other things like multicollinearity, where independent predictive variables are actually highly correlated and that can cause problems with model performance as well. So dimensionality reduction is a way to get around these problems. So the data set that they use in this chapter is the beans data set. So here are some images of different types of beans from this paper. And what has happened to this data kind of before this part is that um, uh, an algorithm has been applied to generate all sorts of information about these bean images in order to calculate lots of different values for different features, such as the area of a bean, the perimeter of a bean, and so on. So we can have a look at that bean's data set and see how these features relate to each other. So here's a quick look at doing a correlation plot of that from all the variables in the bean data set. And we can see here the correlation between these. So for example, it looks like lots of the features are highly correlated. So for example, the area of the bean is highly correlated with the perimeter of the bean, as we might expect. And then lots are negatively correlated. So the compactness of a bean is negatively correlated with the eccentricity, so how much it's stretched out. So again, this kind of makes sense if we think about it. 
and it's showing that we have a lot of variables in this data set that are they're kind of showing the same thing. There are lots of different ways of showing something quite similar. And therefore, it's perhaps a good candidate for dimensionality reduction. So what they then do in the chapter is to prepare this beans data using recipes. So here, this is um, this quote here is from um, a blog that I found quite helpful in giving a sort of overview of what recipes are actually doing with this analogy that the recipe kind of gets the ingredients. So it says like, here's the data, here are the variables that I'm interested in, here's the response variable. You write the recipe, so you have various pre-processing steps. So like creating dummy variables, for example. Then you prepare the recipe. So you provide the training data, the data set to base, base each step on. So for example, if you want to uh, remove any variables that only have one unique value, you need to give it the data so that it can find those variables. Uh, and then it knows what to, it knows to do, to remove that variable each time. And then the bake step is like applying all the steps to your data sets. So um, what happens in the code here is that we have, we split the beans data into testing and training and then start creating the recipe. So the first bit is getting the ingredients. So we say we're interested in the class of the bean and everything else looking at the training data. And then we write the recipe. So, so far this recipe includes uh, three different steps to uh, process our data. And I've given some links at the bottom of these and some examples of recipe steps. So for example, step B is a zero variance filter. So that removes variables that contain only a single value. Uh, and then we've got two others in, uh, in here which are order norm and normalize. So these are ways to uh, basically transform our data to approximate true normal, I believe. And then normalize centers and scales our data. So they all have a standard deviation of one and a mean of zero. So it basically gets um, all, the, all the variables that we've selected and it puts them on the same scale, which, is, which means that we can deal with deal with variables that might be otherwise causing problems. So they give an example of some of these predictors are ratios and they're likely to have quite skewed distributions and that can cause problems with variance calculations. So that's a good example of where we want to use these steps. Um, not used here, but I've also given an example of creating dummy variables where you have categorical variables and you want to instead create dummies. So say like, is this category A, is this category B, is it C and so on. So yeah, so what we've done here, we've got these pre-processing steps. So then we've got our recipe being ready, and we are going to apply that by prepping it on our train uh, training data. And then here we can assess how this performs on the validation data. And uh, then finally you take that and you bake it. So you apply this on the new data, the validation set, I believe. Um, and then I put in here, they've mentioned in the chapter, they've created this function that will allow us to plot the validation results for different dimensionality reduction techniques. So we'll be using that function in the pages coming up. Any questions so far? Uh, no questions, just um, a big thank you. I think it's a big upgrade, upgrade to the quality of the notes. So uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I kind of I looked at some previous videos and I thought there was lots in there that I found helpful in the videos and the chapters that I thought might be worth sticking in there. So let's have a look at our first method, which is principal component analysis, which is probably the one that you're most likely to have heard of. So this is an unsupervised method, so it has no regard for the outcome here, the class of the bean. And it basically try, finds features that try to account for as much variation as possible in the original data. And applying this here is quite simple. So we just add this step, step PCA. And we, um, I'm not quite sure what the num comp is here. I think it's the number that it's showing in the plot. But I think, I think we're just saying that we're looking for four principal components. Might be wrong there. So, yeah. and then we can use, use our function plot validation results to have a look at that. So you can see how these different principal components separate things out. And it seems that 
the first two, PC1 and 2, seem to kind of separate out those clusters quite nicely. Uh, whereas 3 and 4 don't seem to be doing much at all. So we can look into how they're doing so. And here we can look at the, the top loadings of the principal components. I don't really understand why they're called top loadings, but it's it's basically looking at which features contribute most to the principal components, I believe. So we can see here that the first one, the features that contribute most are the axis length, shape factor two, perimeter area. Basically, these are all seeming to be related to the size of the beam. And PC2 is a bit different. Things like eccentricity, compactness, aspect ratio instead seems to be related to measures of elongation. So I think that makes sense. And it, you can see why it might have split those out there and put these similar features together. So in the second method, partial least squares is uh, quite similar to PCA, but it's supervised. So it makes use of the outcome, which is the class of the beam. Uh, so we tell it that. And what it tries to do is to maximize the variation in predictors, but also maximize the relationship between these and the outcome. So again, quite simple to actually apply. And we can have a look at the results. And we can see that, um, I mean, this is what they said, the first two components are quite similar to the first two PCA components, which I think is true. But the others are different. This is what the chapter said, I'm going to believe them. Um, <laughs> let's have a look at the top features for each of these, the top loadings. So here we can see in the third one, we've got things like solidity, roundness. So this sort of seems to be a, a distinct feature, a distinct component that is being used here. Another thing that is not the same as size, and it's not the same as elongation. So it sort of picked out this, this other thing. I feel like I'm actually going through this quite quickly. <laughs> so uh, um, I've not gone into the uh, all the theory behind how to, how all of these work. I know that Federica in the previous book club has gone into this in great detail, which I'm not able to do, but um, it's, it was quite helpful. But hopefully this gives you an idea of how to apply it anyway. And then the third one is independent component analysis. Apparently I can't spell it. Um, <laughs> And this is an unsupervised method here that finds components that are statistically independent from each other rather than uncorrelated. So it's looking at nonlinear relationships to maximize the, the non-Gaussianity. So looking, it's, it's not looking for things with a normal distribution is my understanding of this. So again, you apply this in a quite similar way. Uh, and we can see here that like there's not much separation. There's a kind of bit of separation here, but compared to PCA and PLS, it looks like it's it's not working so well. This method, perhaps, uh, perhaps because it's unsupervised, it's perhaps it's just not so suitable for this data set. And then the fourth one is UMAP or Uniform Manifold Approximation and Projection. It is explained in the chapter and quite dense language, I thought. <laughs> but my understanding of it is that it's um, it's nonlinear like ICA. So that's distinct from PCA and PLS. Uh, it can be quite powerful. So it can divide things up quite a lot. And you can see that here to some degree in the results that it kind of it does create a lot of separation. And the method is that it uses distance based nearest neighbors to find local areas where data points are more likely related. Uh, I believe it generally creates smaller feature sets, and you can also use it in an unsupervised version or a supervised version. So you can tell it the outcome variable or not. Apparently, it can also be quite sensitive to tuning parameters, so that might be something you want to play around with if you're using this. So here's an ex example of using this unsupervised. I'd say it seems to work reasonably well. And then to use it supervised, we just put in that the outcome is the class of the bean, and we can have a look at that. And here we get actually quite good separation. So it looks like the supervised method here is performing quite well. And then the last part is about taking these and applying it along with doing some modeling and seeing how the results compare. 
I had trouble actually running this, so I've used the results from the previous notes, which I think give an example, um, give a nice example of doing this. So you're creating these workflows, and you're saying we've got our list of uh, pre-processing steps that we're interested in. So we've got no dimensionality reduction, uh, just the basic steps. We're, we've, we're going to do PLS, and we're going to do UMAP. And then we're also going to look at lots of different models. Um, so I, I think I haven't put the full code in, in these notes, but you can have a look in the chapter for all the specifications of like the Bayes model, the FDA model, and so on. So what we're going to be doing is having a look at um, these three different dimensionality production techniques in combination with um, all the other model types. Sorry, just having a look at this. Yeah, the pros and cons for these different techniques. That's a good question. Let's, <laughs> let's have um, anyone have any thoughts on that now, or shall we discuss uh, in a minute about the pros and cons? I have not really used them a lot um, with the PCA, but I think doing this chapter was quite, um, I, I learned a lot from it, but there's still a lot of the theory that, well, I think there's theory to understand, and there's also kind of uh, more to be done in terms of trying it out in real life scenarios and seeing what works well and what doesn't, and doing comparisons like this. So we've done our pre-processing and we've done our models, and we're then going to look at the rankings of how well these perform. So rank the results. Oh, we've said that the metric we're interested here is the area under the ROC, the um, receiver operator curve. So that's a measure of how well it's performing. And um, we're then going to plot these and see what they look like. So here you can see in this plot, we have got um, our different types of models. And we've got our different types of dimensionality reduction pre-processing. Overall, the results here, they're all performing pretty well, which is quite interesting. But the one that's performing best seems to be a regularized discriminant analysis with the PLS, with this triangle here. And, and in fact, it seems that like PLS methods in this example, it seems to be performing better than the basic and the UMAP. So I think that's quite a nice example of how you would try these um, on different models and then compare the results. And it makes it quite easy to uh, try them out, I think. And that's it. Sorry, it's quite quick. <laughs> Perhaps we can discuss the if people have used them, their thoughts. Um, so so thank you so much, Freya. Um, I, I have a few both, I think, thoughts and notes and maybe questions. Um, first of all, I'd like to re reiterate that this was a real, um, you, you, you really boosted this, um, um, this chapter notes, these chapter notes, and I, I, I really hope that uh, future cohorts would also benefit from this and not just uh, for us. So first of all, thank you again. Um, I, I wanted to, like for me, one of the main uh, uh, achievements of, of this, of reading this chapter, other than like getting more familiar with some of the like um, uh, dimensionality reduction um, protocols is, is like this idea of prep and bake. Um, which I've seen, I think, Federica uh, used before in like some of our live coding sessions. And actually, like, I wasn't that familiar with it. Like, I've seen it in some kind of like wild code, but never got like the idea of of, of how to use it. And, and this chapter really, really explains it like, re like really well. So like just as a part of the EDA, uh, so for me, it's like, it, it's very helpful, like to uh, actually also without even, you know, um, it's also possible just to conduct it within EDA without the context of modeling, you know, just like as part of like visualization or whatever. And also you can just like prep and bake some recipes. And so, so for me, it was a, a big, uh, like a major tool that I I feel like I got from this chapter. Um, and another thought is is this idea of of uh, validation, um, like the that like the validation set, um, which 
I, uh, it's just, I think it's a little bit of like, uh, you know, it's not like the main issue of the chapter, but I did notice, like, it's not something that is very intuitive for me. And I did notice that um, they changed in tidy models, like the, they deprecated this like validation split function. Um, and now they recommend using uh, initial validation split, which as I, I understand is like a single function where you create both uh, training, validation and testing data. Um, so uh, so just uh, pointing it, it out and it creates, I think, more clear syntax than the like double brackets one where you, like you have to use it, which is like um, less aesthetic, I guess, for like tidyverse people. Um, so you want it to be obvious, don't you, when you're looking at it, like and not have to yeah. look up what number one was. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Thank so, you for so I think, raising yeah. that. Mm. Um, Sorry, and yeah, of course. And I think one last thing that I was thinking about. Um, uh, ju just like addressing your your question about if if I ever used it. So uh, I, as I've said, like my my stats usage is is pretty much uh, limited at, at this point. So I would be really happy to hear from people here. Um, but it does like something that this chapter helps is like it, it's creating like a very accessible framework for conducting PCA. Like if when you know when I read like uh, I think it was chapter two or like when when they present like this scheme of of like the modeling process and and they put uh, like for example PCA in like this workflow um, of like uh, does it belong in, inside the modeling process or outside or whatever and for me it was like okay so it's PCA so it's not something that I I think I would do in like the next few projects but now when i see how simple is it and how accessible it, it is so i i might i might actually you know use it um so so that's like the the final note um so again thank you and i'll be happy to hear more people yeah thank you i kind of feel the same that it does make it quite accessible to play around with and i think this was a a nice data set to do it on so i might see what else i can find in terms of trying this out and seeing what the results are um i see for me that a couple of um stack overflow questions here about prep and bake and juice i I found these a bit difficult at first as well. And I think it's it's partly that I think the names are a little bit unintuitive. And uh, but once you once you kind of read why they're named that, I think it makes sense. So yes, I think these are good good resources. I think, yeah, that this question is from a couple of years ago. I believe that they had deprecated juice and they called it something else, and I can't remember what it was that juice did, but I think it was taken to be a little bit unintuitive in terms of the naming. Um, yeah, so it's a uh, superseded. Um, yeah, sorry, not that and, deprecated. And yeah, and now it just it was, yeah, so it's superseded and uh, not deprecated, but um, it's superseded in favor of, of uh, bake. Um, and I think, as I understand, juice is like just baking with the original data um, rather, th rather than like new data. Oh, yes, because I think it got superseded where you specify which data you're using instead of using a different verb. So, yeah, so I think the recipes, yeah, it's quite useful and it's, it's interesting because at first, you know, they don't really introduce it earlier in the book. So I was thinking, why do I need this? But it actually kind of gives good examples of why you would use it and that it's not too difficult to use. I see Federica has put some um, comments in the chat about the pros and cons from ChatGPT um, about the pros and cons of each of these. 
Yeah, and apparently says that there is not uh, one text, one textbook, um, telling uh, uh, all about pros and cons for all of these techniques. So there are, you can find separate uh, um, books or research papers, uh, but there's not one book uh with this information containing uh, i've asked for um one research paper and listed it, it listed something like dimensionality reduction techniques for big data pre-processing a review uh this is a uh, published on a uh, journal of king south University, Computer and Science Information Sciences, 2018. But my chat GPT is uh, uh, 3.5, so I'm, uh, most probably that would be something more updated. Uh, but it's a good question. Uh, I usually think about supervisor and supervised analysis, so I, uh, and usually use PCA or independent component analysis. But uh, it's, a, it's an interesting topic, uh, especially if you've got many predictors, so if you, if you want to summarize the information uh, and the, the, the variability of the data, uh, mostly. So, yeah, I really like this chapter, and even the visualizations are nice. With a, um, they they quite similar but they different so you they get quite get lost uh, looking at them catching the uh, the differences but your presentation was brilliant fantastic so you professionally explained things uh, wonderfully oh, thank you very much thank you thanks Federica. Um, and yeah, thanks for your comments on the on the different methods. I've got to say, like, I feel like I would sort of be tempted to, you know, to use supervised methods, but um, you know, obviously the unsupervised ones often work quite well. I would, well, in general now, I suppose I would use this technique of trying the different the different dimensionality reduction techniques and seeing how the results come out. But I sort of inherently feel like the supervised ones you know you're giving them more information but it you know it depends what the methods are doesn't it yeah um i have i have a final like not final but, um not not necessarily final but um like a a, a note on a different subject uh Rather than this specific chapter i wanted to thank federica for for the link for the julia silgi um screencast um that she shared with us in the slack channel which i've watched and i i thought it was like um a, a really good uh well like thought recap of, of the last chapter um which really like um encapsulated like this whole idea of workflow sets in, in like a very short and um focused um, coding session. So if you haven't watched it, uh, I really recommend it. I think it really it really creates like a sense of sense of accessibility for for working with the workflow sets. So um, uh, thank you, Federica, um, for for this link as well. Yeah. Yeah. That if you have a look at the at the uh, her um, YouTube channel, you find many videos. Today, um, I found them all useful. So this in particular, because I uh, was talking about workflow sets, so I thought that was uh, interesting for us, uh, for our chapter. But if you want to have an insight about tidy models, that, that's the best, the first source I, I will look at. Thanks, Federica. I, I haven't watched it yet, but it's on my list because I know that uh, Julia always like explains things really quick, clearly, I think. So thanks for sharing that.
All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, there are no more comments or questions. I think we're finished.